Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session where we will be talking about purpose as a driver in business. It is uh, early morning in Los Angeles. Uh, I have uh, a panel here from around the world, um, and I look forward to, to um, uh, diving into this very important topic. Um, before we started, we, of course, also talked about uh, we're living in very special times, uh, and it's all weighing on all our shoulders, uh, and we're sending all our sympathy and love to, to everyone involved. Um, but our focus now will be uh, talking about purpose and actually how can we contribute to a better world uh, because that is much needed. So that is going to be the big uh, theme for today, um, and I hope you will enjoy this session. My name is Anniken Day. Uh, I am from Norway originally. I live in Los Angeles, and I am the CEO and founder of a company called Corporate Spring. We're a consultancy who help companies um, adapt and learn how to um, live and, and lead and work in this new world of work. So this topic of purpose, of course, is very relevant to what I do. And I know it's relevant to the, the rest of the panelists here. So if you please just can introduce yourselves before we get started. Maybe we'll start with uh, uh, Aziz. Yeah. Uh, my name is Abdulaziz Al-Bakr. I'm uh, chairman of BMT, Business Management Technology, based in Saudi Arabia, the company. And I am based in... Uh, I live between London and Saudi Arabia with my family here. So uh, that's my uh, uh, short introduction. Go ahead. Uh, Jeremy, would you like to go next? Absolutely. I'm uh, Jeremy Hymans. I'm the CEO of Purpose, which is an organization that works around the world on mobilizing people on social movement building. Uh, on many issues from climate change to COVID to refugees. Uh, and we work with companies as well on defining and activating their own purpose. So obviously this is a very relevant conversation to me and I'm based in New York City. Not currently there, but I'm based, I'm based in New York. Right now I'm in Paris. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Barmout, would you like to go next? Me? Okay, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the name of you. I'm, <laughs> I'm, based, in, I'm based in Switzerland, and um, I'm the founder and managing partner of uh, Sperry Partners. We are specialized in corporate reputation management, and personal reputation management. Um, my background is I'm originally from Germany. I lived in Latin America and the U.S., uh, running uh, business development for Latin America for Younger Group Inc., Younger Group Inc. Inc. at that time. Um, and then I, I started my own business, and it's very much related to um, corporate governance, sustainability, corporate responsibility, and of course, purpose. Thank you. And Mike? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Mike Dury is my name. I am Canadian, but uh, I am based in, in Germany, in, in Dusseldorf, which is quite near Cologne. And uh, I'm involved with different organizations, but and, and especially for this occasion today, I'd, I'd like to emphasize that, that I am the, the lead for purpose-driven change with the Digital Economist, which is an impact organization that is focused on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and uh, is focused on bringing together technology and, and human beings for, for better outcomes for, for humankind and, and the planet. Very exciting organization. I'm very privileged and and uh, and honored to be part of it. And uh, we create uh, research papers. We we do we bring together investments and organizations, and all in the pursuit of of these better outcomes for for people and for the planet. And uh, yeah, I, the, the whole idea of, of purpose is very, very close to my heart. I do a lot of work in terms of finding the purpose behind organizations, not 
telling them what their purpose is, but actually finding their genuine purpose and uh, creating, you know, momentum surrounding that. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I'm about. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And and there's a reason why we all um, signed up for this session. I think we all have this in common. We are very passionate about purpose. Um, Jeremy, uh, you 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 done a TED talk uh, on this this uh, topic as well, and I could tell you are very passionate about the subject. Can you can you just like very quickly share a little bit where this this passion comes from and why you're so why do you think purpose? You even call your company purpose. <laughs> why is that the thing? Uh, you know, in in the world now. Well, look, I mean, I think we we live in this era where um, I think everybody wants to more closely align what they what they do with their lives and what organizations do with our most deeply held values, right? And I think we no longer have this sense of separation between, uh, you know, between the kind of private sector and the private sphere and um, and the kind of huge challenges that we all face, right? And there's a recognition that um, organizations need to be kind of instrumental to that work. And, you know, I've written a book about this concept of of new power. And part of what new power is about is this urge, not just to see that values are reflected, these sort of uh, contribution societies are reflected in the behavior of companies and organizations, but also um, for people to actually participate in that, to actually bring that alive and be part of it. And so that the convergence, I think, of that um, demand for purpose and that demand for participation, right, not for just being kind of passive bystanders um, to what big institutions do, is, I think, driving a lot of what we're seeing around the world. Hmm. Um, so, Abdullah says, you work in, in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and tell us about, like, your, where does that, uh, you know, thought, your idea around purpose, where, where does it come from? And is that is something you see a lot of in the environment that you work as well? Yes, we see it in, uh, usually it's not uh, part of the the company's purpose. They don't include it in their, uh, uh, in their goals and their mission and in the culture. What happens is the owner, if it's a private company or the owners, they agree on something to do on the side and all of that. But that is not sustainable. But uh, it's not being organized in a, uh, in uh, let's say, uh, in a strategy, and it's not included in uh, uh, in the culture of the company. Usually, when you put that the purpose, and when you announce it, that becomes something that uh, changes the culture and changes the even the, your reputation and the branding of the company and how. The, the whole market looks at you as a company. And even the decision-making and the strategy building becomes much more clear uh, in, once you put it and implement it and announce it. So I think there is, there's still some education and awareness that we need to do in that part of the world mm-hmm. where it's a little bit different than here. But hopefully we're, uh, we're seeing some more consultants like you like Jeremy and Michael and so that that will uh, that are helping organizations over there and who's to be honest who's taking the lead in developing and implementing the purpose led or driven uh, organizations or businesses is some of the the government organizations uh, the government uh, owned companies because some of them are working internationally and the leadership, they understand what's going on. And because of that, they're using all of uh, that knowledge and experience they're gaining from abroad and put implementing it in these companies. But what we need to see is to see it go down to the midsize and small companies and be a community thing. Mm. I, I really like the way that you framed and, and uh, brought culture into uh, the theme, because what we see when we work with companies and cultures, uh, very often um, people have this sense of like, this is the way we're going to work t- together. But if they don't have a purpose, if they don't have a reason to, you know, get up in the morning and the reason why they're going to contribute to this world, 
it's it's hard to kind of build a culture that uh, uh, without having a clear purpose. So when we go in and help companies, you know, that's exactly, as you said, where we have to start. It's like, what are you here to do? Why do you exist? What's your purpose? How are you contributing? So, so I really, you know, it's great to hear, hear your thoughts around that because I think that is missing in a lot of companies to see the connection between culture and purpose. Thank you yeah. so much. Hey, Bernard, uh, when you work, you work as a sparring partner uh, with yeah. CEOs. Uh, do you feel that there is like a general uh, awareness about the importance of purpose? Has, has that changed the last years, do you think? What, what's your I would definitely say so. When my, I started my career, there was a time of shareholder value <clears throat> and image. So mm -hmm. it was just to make money. That was the purpose of a company. And I think this has changed dramatically over time. Um, particularly in the last 10 years. So that's um, 20 years ago, I developed my reputation management program, which um, encompasses all stakeholders and, and all reputation drivers. As we know, purpose is next to, um, uh, to innovation, um, a, a very important reputation driver. But also, I think the purpose is a, now in our understanding and the common understanding much more related to Employees, employer branding concept, I think it has to go beyond. It has to involve all stakeholders uh, to have a shared purpose. And by the way, I think we all, uh, all companies should have a shared uh, purpose with respect to the 17 sustainable development goals as we have to save the planet. And I think uh, um, the companies do have a lot of power now to make a change. And we discussed the Ukraine uh, example, and I think Ukraine could have, the companies could have the power and the purpose to really um, make uh, an influence on, on politics. Uh, they have mm -hmm. to have the power. And so I think we're living in a very intertwined and uh, interconnected world, and um, we have to have, the sh they have to share the purpose. Mm. And, and we are also seeing how purpose uh, uh, or businesses are stepping out now, uh, up now in this situation. Uh, and and it, in a whole whole new way. So so Mike, what is your what's your take on this? Um, how can how can businesses make a difference uh, in the world? I think now when we see nations and countries are really eagerly trying to attract um, foreign investments mm -hmm. by allocating companies in in their country, and uh, and uh, now with the sheer fact that uh, it's not only um, their focus should not only be. Um, business driven and money driven, but driven by purpose, as is a the theme of our panel, that really should think about mm -hmm. does our corporate values, our culture really um, align with the, the nation? We are trying to build a, a, an operation and, uh, mm -hmm. and the political leadership. I think that's key. So we have a tremendous power. And we're just talking about politicians and politics these days, but uh, corporate should be, corporate leaders should be really addressed in, in that sense. Mike, do you think most uh, corporate leaders are aware of this? Uh, not only kind of thinking on their own company, but actually having that look like how do we, how can we contribute to a better world? Is, is that how people are starting to think or is that still quite rare? What's your opinion? Well, I, 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 the, the short answer is no, um, <laughs> sadly. Um, but it, the, the number of corporate leaders who are, beginning to understand the the power of of, of purpose-driven business and and what they can achieve i was at the climate conference in glasgow and uh, it was clear as day that the corporate leadership was much stronger than the political leadership that uh, Corporate leaders are stepping up to the plate. They need to work together with regulators. They need a level playing field. But the statements coming out of co corporations were much bolder and, and, and much more forward-looking than those coming out of politics. And I think a very, a very important thing to remember when we're talking about purpose is that we simply can't, I mean, regardless of how, of how noble those goals are, we simply can't go into an organization and say, this is, this is your purpose. The, these, these are your goals. This is why you are doing what you're doing. Storytelling 
must always begin with story listening. We have to listen to the organization. We have to figure out what's going on in people's heads, why people get up in the morning and go to their jobs. And we have to interpret that and create a narrative that pursues those highest and noblest purposes. And it's not, it's not rocket science. This can be done, but it takes, you know, it takes a sensitive touch and it takes, you know, sensitive listening and, and crafting of, of messaging. So, I mean, this is really where, where, where I see, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a people thing. We really have to be very, very close to people. We have to respect where they are, what they're thinking and what they're doing. And it, if, if you look at the current crisis, again, um, you know, you can see there, there are all of these political machinations going on. But if you look at people in Poland um, volunteering en masse to, you know, help mothers and children and older people arriving, thousands and thousands of people confused, disoriented, scared, hungry, cold, and you see... Um, it's 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 a human thing, and it's it's not impossible. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, you have been working with Purpose for such a long time in so many different companies. As, as I said, like the, your whole work and your your passion and your company is based on that. Um, what do you think is the greatest obstacle for actually being uh, successful in implementing? Purpose. I mean, what is it, what is the the biggest obstacles you are meeting out there when you are talking about it with business leaders? Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's it's become very easy to talk about this, um, which is quite different to you know, kind of practicing this in a real way, right? And so, I think part of what's evolved a little bit in the space is that now companies spend a lot of time developing these kind of very elegant statements of their purpose, right? Um, but those statements don't necessarily mean anything, right? They are aspirational. You know, it's arguably better to have one than, than not to have one. But, you know, our view is that unless a company's purpose is really grounded in its kind of core economic engine, right? So if you're a fossil fuel company, it doesn't matter how many good deeds you do outside of your core business, your purpose has to be getting out of fossil fuels, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is just a reality, right? And so you can be incredibly philanthropic and generous, but that's not what we mean when we talk about purpose. So I think the biggest barrier is aligning the purpose to the core economic engine of the business. And mm -hmm. it's actually not having the purpose be, you know, in a kind of good deeds department, but actually have the purpose be embedded in the sales targets, embedded in the things that actually drive the economic engine of the business. Otherwise, like, it'll be a kind of prop on the side. It'll be a communications tool rather than a, um, a reality. So we always ask our, you know, our clients to really look closely at their core economic engine. And it's, it's quite a different scenario if you're working with a company that is already doing something that's inherently helping a big problem, right? Like if you're a solar company, you're already part of a solution, right? Um, rather than a problem in general. To if you're um, a company that has kind of really important work to do on your own core business, and then there's a whole spectrum between, right? And so I think um, part of what's being lost in the debate now is it's almost like the word purpose has become the new what we used to call in you know business back in the day mission, vision, and values. It's you know, a mission statement is not what a purpose is. Hmm. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you meet a lot of resistance when you say that? I mean, because uh, I can imagine if like an oil company hired you to come in and, and, and help them with their purpose, uh, you, will, you will be challenging them quite a bit. How, how? Yeah, well, I mean, I think with purpose as, a, as an organization, we only work with companies that we think are actually serious about that work, right? Um, and so if it is a company that is 
you know, inherently has a, generating a lot of negative externalities in the world, the core question is not how do we weave a great story about what we're doing, but rather how do we get that work done and engage our stakeholders in that work, right? Mm. Um, we know that if employees are not with them, if shareholders are not with them, they'll get resistance, right, it's, if they are trying to make those changes. So I think we, um, we absolutely take that posture. And, you know, our work is inherently very multi-sectoral. So part of what we have to do is remain credible to these different actors so we can bring them together around big problems. And that requires being quite honest, frankly, um, and being quite careful about, you know, what we do and who we, who we do it with. Yeah. If, if I can just interject there, um, I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's also about finding the purpose behind the purpose. You know, somebody will tell you, oh, I, I, I need to go out and buy a drill. Do you need a drill? No. You need a hole in the wall. Do you need a hole in the wall? No. You need a hook to hang up a picture. Do you need a hook to hang up a picture? No. You want a picture on the wall. You know, so uh, just going deeper and finding what it's really all about. And I, I, I had a project a few years back with uh, the Swiss company that invented the breast pump. And uh, Anakin, I don't know if you have children, but <laughs> that's, I, I hear different reports from women about <laughs> the, the virtues of the breast pump. But this, the, the person who invented this thing, this was a Swiss doctor, and he firmly believed at a time where the med medical community was telling young mothers that they should give their babies formula. And he firmly believed that there could not possibly be anything better for babies than mother's milk. And so there was a conflict in his company because the patents had run out. And, you know, they were facing competition from, from cheaper Me Too products typical situation and so they were trying to expand digitally you know create apps and and so on nursing apps and you know chat rooms and so on and so the process to find this this core purpose led us to the point where we said okay this is really this company is all about the mother baby bond it's not about this device this pump yeah. that's just one part of it and everything we do everything the company does uh, does has has to do with this bond between mothers and babies which i think you know i'm not an amateur psychologist but i think we can all agree that this is essential to a healthy um, psychological uh, development for for any human being, and this was something everybody could get on board with, and where the digital people, the nerds, you know, the people nobody took seriously in the company, uh, suddenly it was accepted. Hey, you know, you're making a contribution. You're you're we're we're all working toward the same goal. That's where we have to go with purpose. Yes, thank you. Bernard, what do you think? I think the um, <clears throat> companies are really now faced with the um, inflation of um, intangible assets and soft assets. Um, you mentioned, Jerry mentioned um, vision, mission, uh, values. So they're get it, getting it, at least in, to, to my experience, a little bit tired of, of that. And how is this, is this going to be implemented and executed and operationalized to, to all the people top down and as I said, beyond the corporation to including all stakeholders and just to make sure they share the same purpose. Um, and then on top of that, we see that the business environment is dramatically changing. We see merchant acquisition. And while a company starts to define its culture, it's being bought uh, uh, or it's buying somebody else. And they, they're in a new process of de defining a new corporate culture, a new purpose. And this makes it really difficult. And at the same time, also, um, we're reading that millennials, are they want to have a purpose. They would know why they really want to share the values of a company. But at the same time, 
they're quite reluctant to to adapt it. That's my experience. Maybe that's not uh, for sure. And uh, maybe that also depends on the on the strength of communication of the leadership and convince that this is really aligned purpose. But I think there are just a number of obstacles in, in the real world which makes this beautiful um, sounding uh, purpose really difficult to live and make everybody stand behind it and be the reason why they get up in the morning. You know, there was a, a PVC study that showed that 79% of the executives thought uh, that having a, a purpose was crucial to their business. But yeah. then only 34% said they actually used it as a guidepost as they were making decisions. Yes, um, yes. So for the managers uh, or leaders on this call uh, that want to have some advice, how, how do we actually go about this? So how do we, we, we do this in practice? And how do we not only kind of think it as a statement, as, but as a way to conduct our business? Uh, Abdullah says, you, do you have any, any um, ideas or any advice for those leaders? Uh, I think uh, being uh, practical is very important when uh, thinking about uh, the purpose and injecting it in, in the company's principles. You have to be practical and select the, the right purpose for the company uh, to do, regardless of what you are doing, but nothing that will conflict because uh, uh, sometimes it might affect your financials. For example, uh, CSV, the pharmaceutical in the U.S., in 2014, they dropped selling cigarettes because it conflicts uh, with their uh, purpose and it affected their financials. So you have to think it very carefully. It was a very good move that they did it. And everybody, some of the shareholders or so, did not like it because it affected the financials. Mm. But you have to think about it. Uh, even like what Jeremy said, the oil and gas companies, I think they should participate, regardless of what's happening and all of that. There's still a business for them. But pushing them, pushing these companies also to participate in, uh, in having a purpose that will have a, a good impact on the communities, regardless. And we should not put a, uh, a limitation or a geographic limitation to the impact of your purpose that you're doing. A lot of companies that even Jeremy worked with, and I, I think he's very experienced in that area, they deliver uh, a lot of uh, campaigns and relief campaigns abroad, uh, outside the borders of the U.S. and or the, the country they live in. So I think it needs to be thought and agreed upon with the stakeholders uh, so that there, there would be a commitment. And from there, you can pass it on to the whole company. Hmm. Right. Jeremy, what do you think is, is how do you align, you know, the purpose with the actual, you know, how you conduct this? What would be your advice to a, a leader who has that, who might not be there yet, but has the intention of, of getting there? Right. Well, I mean, I think if you're, you know, if you're a CEO that is, is leads a business that, that, you know, is, you know, a fossil fuel company, for example, or, or a PepsiCo where there's, for example, or a Coca-Cola where there's a lot of, you know, public health problems arising out of the product, right? Then I think the work is, you know, how do you mobilize the markets and your, your investors and your own company around that change journey? Right, and some of those change journeys are going to are, are more urgent than others. Right, so if you're a fossil fuel company, you know we, the planet just can't afford new coal. It can't afford you know um, new oil exploration, and so there are going to be regulatory pressures there for sure. But there's also, I think, a need for company uh, CEOs and, and leaders to actually. Um, break some of the boundaries of the traditional system, which is like, well, look, we can't do anything. It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's shareholder value that we must maximize, right? Already that sacred cow is being challenged as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, but the work, you know, is not easy, right? Because some of the CEOs who've really tried to push hard on that transformation journey have found that they've gotten backlash, right? And they've gotten, uh, they've come out too far ahead and, um, some of the more traditional uh, actors 
have come after them, right? We saw that with uh, Emmanuel Faber at Danone, for example, when he did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, uh, sorry, if I can just uh, <laughs> jump in here briefly. I, I think um, we, ha we have to be kind of careful because, uh, you know, if you, if you look at Coca-Cola, it's a, a cultural icon. Um, there is no evidence that sugar-free soft drinks uh, are healthier than you know, sugar containing soft drinks. It's, it's, it's a slippery slope. It's, it, it's really difficult. And if you think of the values that a company like Coca-Cola embodies, um, these are not trivial. You can do something, you can go someplace with that. If you look at a fossil fuel company, then you could also, you could, you could say, okay, this company is, is about energy. It's not, you know, it's uh, the the same. I had um, recently a really interesting conversation with a venture capital company that is interested in geothermal energy, is investing heavily in ge geothermal energy, not just interested. Mm. And it just so happens that the oil and gas industry is ideally positioned to pursue that. They have the technology, they have the infrastructure. Um, so, I mean, the, these are some really exciting things that can happen. So, I mean, if you look at, okay, what is Coca-Cola really about? You know, um, it, it's, it's, as I said, a cultural icon. It's something uh, that gives people pleasure and joy. Whether or not Coca-Cola itself is directly contributing to these health problems that is that's not so easily defined so i mean the same as the cosmetics industry can say okay uh hey girls you have to put all this stuff on otherwise you're not pretty enough or y y they can also say we have these products you can use to care for yourself to nurture yourself to nurture your self-esteem um you know, there are different ways you can go without abandoning your your core values. And I, I and I, again, I think you, you you can, regardless of how noble the uh, objectives are, the goals are, you can't just go in and say, okay, this is your purpose. Th these are your ideals. <clears throat> this is where we're going. You have to listen to the organization. You have to find the soul of the organization and pursue that. Oh, I agree with you uh, to, to listen to the organization and, and invite them into the dialogue. Because what we are seeing a lot is like uh, this, the purpose statements or the, the outspoken purpose doesn't always mean a thing, especially like, like the larger organization, the less um, relevance it has for people. So one of the things that we often talk about uh, is, especially because when you work in large corporations and you work on the team level, it is like translating that that grand purpose into something that is meaningful. Uh, so, how do you actually make that connection uh, of like wanting to 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 change the world for the better to the person who's sitting and doing the accounting or or programming this little on this little chip or, or uh, yeah? So, so making that connection and having people feel ownership for it, even though they can't maybe see exactly how they're contributing, that they know that what they're doing is important for, for the bigger picture. So um, Bernard, as a CEO sparring partner, how do you guide and, and advise the leaders you work with in how to make this purpose and, and working with that in a practical manner? Well, talking about um, maybe just referring to what has been said about the soul of a company, which I think is a very important point, I, I understand that in many companies, this soul it doesn't exist anymore. It has got lost due to a couple of points, due to M&As, uh, due to high fluctuation in the leadership. Mm -hmm. So you don't have find a person who really would say, this is the core value, core essence and the soul of the company. So it's very hard to dig into that. Mm -hmm. And you have to go back to history, what, what, is, what the company has come from in the context of a drastically and dramatically changing environment, business environment. So 
Um, this is one of the points we, we, we sit down in management and we try to find people who have been with a company for a couple of years to see if they have been for 20 years. They have gone through all the changes, the evolution, and they really understand um, what the company stands for um, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of values and, and purpose. And um, so you have to dig into that. You have to identify the right people and... Um, mm -hmm and take this as a, as a uh, I would say, an evolutionary process um, and to join them in, in, in the process as a sparring partners and then help them. This is cru crucial to implement mm -hmm. this um, really top down to any, any employee in the company. And we're talking about global companies and, and with different cultures. So we have to find the right language for them to understand this is relevant to me and I'm able to convey this to my to the outside world. So uh, it's a long-term process and this requires a true commitment by the, by the management. So what's interesting now as well is with the great resignation and people, I mean, like, it's like 4 million people every month that leave their jobs here in the U.S., people are, are kind of redesigning their whole work life thinking. And we, the great uh, reflection is what many say, like people are starting to question, like how are they actually spending their lives? Are they, is, is it um, for the first time Americans are actually asking like, should, should work take this much room in my life or sh is there more, right? So, so you have that work-life balance, but also that people want to contribute to something positive when they are actually working. So um, Edelman Trust Barometer said, uh, showed that it was like, I think it was 70%, 80% of all people who are now looking for new jobs, they want to have a job that has some kind of social impact. So the companies that are able to uh, show their, their, their purpose and their social impact will naturally um, attract new people and, and retain them as well. And that is actually one of the biggest challenges the business world is facing now. So could it be that we could use also this situation that people, even those who might not be wanting to make the world a better place, because to be quite honest, there's a lot of leaders that does not have that like uh, um, on the forefront of their agenda, um, to use this new situation in the market, in the world, uh, work world, to uh, inspire or, or motivate people to actually start uh, taking a more um, a serious look at their purpose and start not only you know saying it but doing it seriously because people won't want to work in those in companies that does not uh, actually contribute to a more positive environment what's your your opinion anyone who and uh, abdullah says what 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 do you think about i think it's good if it's uh, if it's uh, marketed by the governments the leaders but it all comes down to the business community if the business community empowers that and pushes it, uh, it makes a difference. I'll give you one example, and this made a, a big wave in, uh, in the companies, in the private investment and, and others also. BlackRock, which is the largest uh, uh, asset management company, they have uh, $7 trillion of investment. They made a decision that they will pull out of companies that are not, uh, uh, they don't reach a certain level of ESG compliance, which is a very good thing. So if BlackRock and the other big names, they do the same, then they all the business community, whether in the U.S. or internationally, one and the shareholders, the board members that are thinking about profitability and so on, will be, let's say, motivated, if not forced, to, to, to reach a certain level of compliance of ESG. And then they will have to think about it and implement it and so on. And that gets the, roll bowling, uh, the ball rolling. And then after that, you create that... Uh, uh, that system and then they can develop more and that i think it will uh, it will create uh, a lot of influence on the whole uh, business community and the leaders mm. yes that's true and when we think about like what's happening right now in the world and as well as we see businesses are taking a stand and are pulling uh you know their their products uh off the market because like showing their support for um ukraine 
Uh, what is your your take on on um, businesses role in also contributing to world peace or to to uh, like very um, uh, you know events that's happening here and now? Do, do you think it's 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 like a dangerous path? Do, is it the right thing to do? Is it uh, is it uh, you know, reasons why why companies should more or less anyone. Jeremy, what's your what's your take? You look at like what's happening now and and how this aligns with what companies stand for. Yeah, well, look, I think in general, you know, what we're seeing a lot more of is employees of companies, particularly in uh, you know in Europe and the US and um, many parts of the industrialized world, really expect their employers to speak out on kind of major issues of the day that are kind of moral litmus tests, right? Things like racial justice, LGBT rights, um, and in moments like this, right, um, like Ukraine. So people don't expect their companies, their corporations to be apolitical. They actually want their companies to, to be principled and take a stand. Now, that isn't all good, right? I mean, there's lots of um, ways in which corporations have used their political influence in very harmful ways, obviously, um, on many issues. So we don't necessarily want a, a world where corporations replace the role that governments and civil society play. That said, it's kind of the reality now. And so in a world where, you know, if, you know in a world where corporations are either going to stand on the sideline or they're going to use their resources and their voice at these critical moments, right? Like this is one right now. Right. There's no neutrality really possible on what's happening right now in Ukraine. Right. In the same way that there's also no real there's no sort of both and position on climate change or on, you know, on on those kinds of issues. And so that's what, where we're headed. Right. But you will get these kind of culture wars then where some companies take the opposite position on some of these issues, you know, and it becomes kind of like, well, you know, I'm from one tribe and this company is from the other tribe. Um, and I think we're seeing that in the US now, right? So in some of these cultural debates, um, the red-blue divide is tracking as well a little bit to corporate uh, behavior and response to some of these issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. there, there's a really interesting book that uh, talks about a lot of this stuff by Rebecca Henderson. It's titled Rethinking, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> right. well, I, I'm sorry, I mean, we have two minutes left now. I'm, I'm sorry, but it, maybe you could, if you remember the title of the book, if you could type it uh, down. Okay, uh, yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, yeah, yeah, we have to wrap it up here now. Do you, do you um, yeah. Bernard? Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I don't know if they could have himself or not here, but uh, Bernard, do, do you have uh, the last wise words that you? Would oh like my to, goodness! To okay, okay, there you go. Okay. <laughs> about what? About the uh, topic today? <laughs> yes, uh, just like uh, we've been addressing a yeah, lot. But the last I was just like repeating my words. I think it's um, the corporate world has a tremendous power these days, and while politics are dividing people, corporations have. Um, if they stick, for instance, to the overarching uh, principles and the uh, 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, they have a tremendous power to make things happen and um, make uh, voices heard. And um, this would attract employees. That would attract, uh, make them uh, increase retention of employees, and that would really uh, resolve many problems. I think they should really raise their voices much more. Great. Well, uh, I think our time's up, uh, and I really want to thank all of you for uh, your yeah. wonderful contributions. And everyone, who, anyone who wants to to follow, I don't know, maybe you last words. How, how do how can people get in touch with you? How can people get in touch with you, Jeremy, if they want to check out uh, you and your company? Yeah, so the company is Purpose dot com, uh, and the book that I refer to is called New Power with Henry mm -hmm. Timms. And you can find me on Twitter uh, at Jeremy Hymans. Amazing. Thank you. Abdulaziz, how, we, how do we get in contact with you? Well, uh, I'm available on different platforms, but uh, I could be uh, reached on LinkedIn and also uh, through uh, bmt-sa.com. Uh, so uh, that, and also recently I joined uh, Twitter, so uh, I'm available also there, although I'm not active. 
I'm more <laughs> active on LinkedIn. Okay, great, thank you, Mike. How do we uh, how do we get in contact with you? Well, yeah, you yeah. can find me on on LinkedIn, Mike Dury, D U R R I E. Um, I'm involved with three different companies, and each one with its own website. Um, and I, I, I can I can put put those companies in, in the chat so you, so you can find them. And uh, yeah, I hope to connect with you all, and and hope to have a chance to continuing to continue the dialogue. This has really been very very interesting and. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, we just uh, we we need to talk more about this this stuff and and pursue it further. And I think just touching back again on this 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 last point, it it takes two to tango. You know, the the corporate world and the regulatory governmental world have to work together. And if you look at the past, I mean, specifically in the U.S., in the post-war U.S., this was really what, what created the, the, this amazing growth in prosperity. Same here in, in Germany. I mean, the Marshall Plan, obviously, but also the work with unions, with corporations, with governmental organizations. It's possible. They, they don't have to be... Uh, enemies. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if we're still recording or not because we're gone over yeah. time. But uh, in case we are, Bernard, how, how do we? Uh, yes, how do we... Um, I have my website is reputationmanagement.ch. Um, mm -hmm. Product is a hero. I'm on LinkedIn. I wrote a couple of books, and the last book is um, also written in English. The other one only in German. The last one is uh, Corona Insights for Life. It's a very small booklet. Uh, which I wrote in the in the beginning of the pandemic, trying to uh, to visualize, anticipate what's going to happen, and at some points I was right with my predictions. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, guys. It was great to see you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Much, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Passing Thank you. by Saudi Arabia or London, please let me know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Like Thank I'll you. I'll send you the pictures, the groupy pictures. Yes. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.